Okay, so let's move this one. Yeah. See if it works. Good. Yep, the loop you can move in there. Hopefully it works on chip. Yep. Okay, so um, last time we we had a little preview ahead, I mentioned uh, stereographic projection <coughs> as giving a way to um, compactify Euclidean space. So let me let me think of this now as a, a sort of general question. Um, <clears throat> so you, you imagine that you have some big space, and this diagram is very light, I hope you can see it at the back, but does it <laughs> not that the details matter, so there's supposed to be some, some manifold which is not compact. So, um, <clears throat> so, so say a, a um, non-compact geodesically complete manifold. <clears throat> so we think of that as a big space, like, it's like Euclidean space, but some other big space perhaps. Um, and so, in mathematics, you may want to know how to deal with this far region up here. <laughs> so, so can, can you make a good notion of infinity that's sort of mathematically useful, you know, so you can really do things? Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that people, you know, traditionally have done is, is the idea of scattering. You know, so somehow you want to sit out at infinity and send waves in, um, see what they do, and when the waves come back, see what they <laughs> see what happens. Well, that's a sort of if you're in Romanian signature, they're not really waves, you're solving Laplacians or something. But anyway, that philosophically, that's the sort of idea. Right, radar. <coughs> um, but, you know, so, so in order to do that, you, you want to know what you mean by sitting out at infinity and how to set that up properly. Um, <coughs> so, but we can even think of this just purely as a separate problem. So, you know, how do we add a infinity here properly? And then what geometry will, will infinity have? Um, and as I was alluding to last time, there's questions of uniqueness. Perhaps there's many ways of adding, adding this infinity, or perhaps there's just one. You know. So these are the sorts of things as mathematicians um, <coughs> you're interested in knowing. And if you're a physicist, the uniqueness may be important too. OK, so a little bit more mathematically, a compactification in the topological sense of a, of a non-compact topological space is just an embedding um, as a dense subset of a compact space. So we think of the non-compact one, as, if you like, as being large and the compact one as being small. Even though, as I pointed out last time, you may, may want to actually add points. Okay, but we're in the sort of smooth category here. Um, so for us, um, this embedding will be smooth um, and you know, M, M will be open and dense. Now, in general, the you know the answer the compactification <coughs> might take all sorts of forms. We compactified Euclidean space and just got a sphere. Um, more generally, you might get a, comp a manifold with boundary um, or a manifold <coughs> with with um, a boundary and corners and so on. So it could be quite complicated, but very often, and, and, and it's what I want you to think about. It will be the answer will be that M is the um, interior of a manifold with boundary. And the boundary will be the sort of additional part that you're, you're adding to make the compactification. So that's the sort of simple picture to keep in your head. <coughs> um, but even if you do that, right, so suppose that's the picture you end up with. So how do we, you know, find what's the geometry on the boundary? So or originally, you know, this, <laughs> this is at infinity for the, for the manifold M. So in principle, understanding what the geometry is sounds complicated. If you do achieve that, then you might want to have what I call boundary calculus, which means some way of relating the boundary geometry and the fields that are there to the, to the things on the bulk, as they call it, the interior of the manifold. So, so sort of a concrete way to do that. Um, <coughs> so, um, well, I guess I'm going to talk about one way of approaching this. And the idea or the motivation of this is, is, is to discover new links between different geometries. So, you know, this is a nice tool, this compactification, because you do get geometries induced on the boundary typically, and then the whole construction gives you a, a, a tool for studying those sort of geometries compared to the ones in the bulk. Um, and then we might also, you know, get a more geometric and conceptual approach to, to some PDE boundary problems and the link, you know, as linked perhaps to scattering and non-local operators and all that stuff. Any questions about the program? Good. Okay. So here's the picture you saw before, which I just wanted to remind you. So we compactified Euclidean space by just adding one point. 
Um, I gave you that exercise that you will all have done now, um, <coughs> that this is conformal, so that preserves angles. Um, and there was the question of whether that was the only way to compactify Euclidean space. And then we looked at, <coughs> as, as another glimpse ahead, this compactification of Minkowski space. So <coughs> Minkowski space, of course, the picture it looks, Minkowski space still looks like that, but it just has a different metric on it. And when you conformally compactify it, you get this sort of different sort of boundary. Instead of just getting a one point compactification, you have, um, <coughs> you have, a, have a boundary, but it, it, it's a boundary with these also um, sort of I, uh, singular type points, if you like, I, I zero and I plus. Um, <coughs> okay, and I already asked all those questions. You know, is, is it the only way to do it? Blah, blah, blah. So we should be thinking about that. So since it's a, <coughs> a talk with lots of pictures, here's yet another one. Um, so this is, <coughs> this is one I want to, you know, this, this is one we want to treat <coughs> rather explicitly. In fact, we'll treat all of those ones. But <coughs> um, So here's Ash's compactification. So he compactified a, a big, big family of fish. So basically, um, these, these fish all have the same size in the geometry. This is hyperbolic geometry. Um, and you know, they appear to get smaller, but in the metric of, of that, of, you know, of, of the, the fish are living in, they're all the same size. You know? so, but because it's been embedded in the plane, say perhaps the unit circle, um, or the unit disk rather, um, they, they, they had to be... Um, Transform somehow, and it's actually conformal, right? So, so here it is mathematically, and now done in any dimension. So, this is the embedding of um, hyperbolic space, d-dimensional hyperbolic space, um, into the Euclidean um, Euclidean d-dimensional space, <coughs> in, into the unit ball, right? So, so here's here's the Euclidean metric. That's just um, you know dot the dot product. <laughs> so, the, the usual flat metric, and then we're <coughs> conformally rescaling it by four over. 1 minus, and here's the dot product again, x squared. So, so when, when x dot x is 1, this is something over 0, so it's infinite. So, so this is taking the Euclidean uh, metric and, and making it you know, blow up to infinity as you get to the boundary. So, and then this, if you calculate you know, any way you like, this, is, this has, has negative um, sectional curvature of, of minus 1. Right? So it's actually hyperbolic space. And, and, and this... This is actually a compactification of a hyperbolic space because it's because the, you know here it is it has the boundary the sphere, um, and well you might think what well, you know what's the geometry on the boundary well in one sense it's the round sphere metric, but this this is putting more geometry this this picture and this construction as given right here is putting a bit more geometry than you want the natural geometry that should show up on the boundary here is conformal geometry so. So it will be good to see why that is. <coughs> okay, so we want to understand that in a different way. Um, <coughs> okay, but based on that picture, so, so that, this formula has, and, and this sort of embedding of hyperbolic space into the sphere has, I guess, been one of the main <coughs> um, pictures or ideas that people have used to, to abstract the notion of conformal compactification. So here is... <laughs> what you know, if you if you talk about some analysts studying sort of scattering problems and so on, um, <clears throat> when they talk about a conformal compactification, they will usually mean this, right? So, so they would talk about a Riemannian manifold, but we will also allow pseudo Riemannian. Um, <clears throat> so it's a smooth manifold with boundary such that <clears throat> there's a metric. So the ma the metric you start with is this G plus. So here it is. So your manifold with G plus before you put the boundary on. So it's going to be the interior of a manifold with boundary, so, so the manifold, the one you want to compactify. And on the manifold with boundary, which is the M bar, we have a metric, <coughs> G bar, that's actually conformally related to the, to the one we started with. If you're doing physics, G plus is your original physics metric, uh, physics metric yeah, like your space-time metric. If you're doing mathematics, it's your geometric metric you started with. Um, <coughs> so you want another metric that's conformally related to it, G bar. But we want that to go to the boundary. So, so G bar is a metric that goes to the boundary. And not only that, the conformal factor is like this. So G plus is R to the minus 2 G bar, where R is a defining function for the boundary. Right? So what's that mean? It means that the boundary is exactly the zero set of R, 
and that the, the, the differential of R is nowhere vanishing on the boundary. That's what you mean by a defining function. And we saw one in action here. So, so you know, that, that's exactly in this form where the R would be this <coughs> 1 minus x squared over 2. Right? So, <coughs> so it's sort of modelled on that, if you like. Okay, now the claim is that this gets a canonical conformal structure on the boundary. So why is that? Well, <coughs> if you think of this metric G plus as fixed, right, that's your geometric metric, so that's sort of set in stone, what you're allowed to change is this defining function, right? So why not? Well, how can you change your defining function to get another defining function? Answer, um, so you can multiply it by another positive function, right? Or sorry, by a positive function. So, so R vanishes on the boundary, but if we multiply R by, um, you know, let's say S or something, which is a positive function, then <coughs> the zero locus will still be the boundary, and the, 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 the differential of R, will, or S times R, will, will be nowhere vanishing on the boundary. Okay, so, but if we change the defining function, <coughs> the G plus is fixed, then we'll have to conformally change the G bar to, to fix up for that rescaling of the R, right? So that changes G bar by a conformal factor. Now, every, every one of these G bars that you get induces a metric on the boundary, but when you change your mind about this defining function, you get this conformal change, so you get a conformally related induced metric on the boundary, and hence, <coughs> you know, what you get canonically on the boundary is a conformal structure. Hope that's clear to everyone. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so what, what you get on the boundary is a conformal structure. On the interior, you have a metric, um, <coughs> you know, Romanian or pseudo-Romanian. If we're in the pseudo-Romanian case, everything I'm talking about is the case where DR is not null. I, do, I just want to avoid the case where DR is null. It's, 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 that can happen, but it's more complicated. Okay, so, but you see that you have a canonical link now between a conformal structure and a metric, and this is, this is the tool. That was the idea of Fiffman and Graham as a way of even studying conformal geometry to, to sort of start with a conformal manifold and, and rebuild this picture um, in, their, in their program of studying conformal geometry. Anyway, so G plus is called conformally compact if you can do this. Um, I will say it's Poincaré Einstein if the interior metric's Einstein. <coughs> In Romanian signature, that's a sort of standard terminology. When the metric's pseudo-Romanian, it's a kind of lousy terminology, but I want to just, you know, <laughs> simplify it for the talk. Okay, now, coming back to the, to the compactifications, we looked at a bunch of different compactifications. There was Euclidean space, Minkowski space, um, and, and then um, Escher's fish thing. So the compactifications all look a bit different, right? So that we got very different sorts of boundary things. So is there a sort of, um, but they were all conformal, right? So they were all conformal geometry. So the question is, is there a, um, a, a uniform principle that's going on that explains all of this stuff? Okay, so... Now, one thing you might observe is that these sort of these are sort of model geometries for this purpose, right? So there was Euclidean space, Minkowski, and hyperbolic. They're all Einstein and conformally flat. Well, we know the models for conformally flat. Well, at least you know we we had the the sphere, the conformal sphere. That's a nice model for conformally flat. In in Minkowski and signature, we we gave another model which was S one cross. Um, Sn <coughs> with its sort of flat conformal structure. So we know how to do models for that. What we don't need to, un what we don't understand is the Einstein part, right? So we'd like to get that straight. Okay. So, <coughs> so recall here is just recall. So, <laughs> recall that we, we, you know, the way we got the tractor connection was we looked at this equation, um, <coughs> the, the conformal to Einstein equation. So, so the metric. So if you start with the metric G and u is a um, positive function, let's say, then u to the minus 2 times g, which is our new metric g bar, is Einstein, meaning that the Ricci is proportional to the metric, um, if and only if there exists this positive function u solving this, right, this equation. Now, <coughs> I call that this almost Einstein equation because I want to allow also the case, because that's just a linear equation, so you can allow u to be 0, why not? And we saw that you know, this corresponds, we saw yesterday that this corresponds to <laughs> parallel tractors, so that gives the tractor connection. 
<coughs> okay, so well, I didn't talk so much about you know, this parallel condition. Um, so let's look at that in a little detail. So, um, <coughs> right. So, <coughs> okay, so here's the formula for the tractor connection that I wrote down. All right, so just take a look at that again. So, so here's our tractor. It's a triple. It, it has, in the middle, it has our one form or section of the tangent bundle, but I'll think of it as a one form field. Uh, it's weighted, but that's only a small detail at the moment. It has uh, sigma, which is a density of weight one. Think of it as a function if you don't know about densities. And rho, which is a density of weight minus one. Again, think of it as a function if you want. Okay, and then here's the formula for the connection. It's the levy sevita connection on each of those plus a sort of um, algebraic correction, which is mixing up those slots with bits of the metric and curvature and so on. <clears throat> now, what's it mean to say this is parallel? Well, one thing, here's a, here's a necessary condition. If, if I is parallel, then all of these things are zero, of course. Then in particular, you see that mu has to be the derivative of sigma. That was sort of how we defined uh, mu, right? So, so if, if, if this is parallel, then mu is forced to be the derivative of sigma. Also, if you trace this middle one, you can work out what rho is, right? So if, um, if this is parallel, then rho is um, the, the uh, minus the, the Laplacian acting on sigma um, plus W um, J sigma. So, <coughs> yeah. Okay, so, but the important thing is that if I is parallel, then what that means is that actually I is in the image of some differential operator, right? Because, because well, six sigma is just sigma, but then mu is the derivative of sigma, and rho is the Laplacian on sigma, more or less. So, so, the, so if I is parallel, it's in the image of a differential operator. So an immediate consequence is that if it's not zero, so suppose your manifold's connected, right? Just <laughs> I'll assume that for simplicity. So if your manifold's connected, if, if, the, if you have a parallel thing that's not zero, it means that sigma's non-vanishing on an open dense set, right? So in other words, this equation, this overdetermined equation, if you have a um, <coughs> if you have a solution that's not trivial, it's not the zero solution, then then, then U is automatically non-vanishing non on an open dense set. And we see that by, by looking at, at, in terms of this, uh, <coughs> you know, what, what the formula for the connection is. And the connection, remember, was just the prolongation of that equation. Okay, so, <coughs> and then of course where sigma is not equal to zero, um, if you square it, the sign of sigma won't matter, so you get a metric that's Einstein. Um, <coughs> and conversely, if when you do sigma to the minus 2g, um, you get something Einstein. Then when you make this operator um, on, on sigma, you get something parallel. By this operator, I mean the operator d, which is, which is taking, it gives you sigma, the derivative of sigma, and that in the bottom slot. Okay, so we call that the scale tractor. I'll come to that on the next slide, but or so. <clears throat> okay, so, um, <clears throat> so this... You know, well, we basically did, we already have this result really because we derived the the tractor connection from the um, Einstein equation from this conformal to Einstein equation. But if you just look at this formula, if it is parallel, and you work in the scale of sigma, when you work in the scale of sigma, the derivative of sigma with respect to the levi sevita connection it determines is zero. Remember, so mu goes away, <coughs> and then this middle equation just gives us, so this is equal to zero, remember, it's just giving us that the scouting is proportional to the metric. So, <coughs> so if it's parallel, um, then when sigma's not zero, you're, you have an Einstein metric. Okay, and the converse is easy. That's that thing we did yesterday, or you know, you, I, I, I set it, finishing this story as an exercise, but, but it was the prolongation, so you, you take a solution. Okay, so, we call this thing the scale tractor, that, that, that is this operator that, that came from the connection. But <coughs> when you start with sigma and you form this operator, which is conformally invariant, um, that doesn't mean you're parallel, but if you are parallel, then, then I has to be in the image of that operator. So we'll say that <coughs> in the case that it's parallel, that the, that the manifold is almost Einstein. So if you just take a, a, a conformal manifold, equip it with a parallel tractor, 
Um, <coughs> let's say the manifold is connected, so to keep, keep the statement simple, then we'll say it's almost Einstein. And the reason is that um, on an open dense set, sigma is going to be non-zero, <coughs> and you'll get an Einstein metric. That's what almost, so it's almost everywhere Einstein. <coughs> Okay, now we want to understand a bit about the zero set and so on. So, because we're saying that, that if you have a parallel tractor, then, then on an open dense set, it's determining an Einstein metric. Where it's zero, that's, that's some sort of conformal infinity or something, so we need to understand what the zero locus looks like. <clears throat> okay, so um, I just want to introduce some notation terminology. So I'll just say that if you have a conformal manifold, equipped with one of these densities of weight 1, and then I'll call it almost pseudo-Ramanian if, if the image under this, this D operator is, is nowhere zero. Okay, so, and we call I then a scale tractor, right? So, so here's the formula for this 1 over D D operator, right? So this is so-called Thomas D operator, but this is conformally invariant, the map from sigma to that. It's a conformally invariant operator. The, the image will say it's a scale tractor provided this is nowhere vanishing, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then um, the, one of the things that's important is that what is the length of this thing, or the length squared of this thing according to the tractor metric? So, remember we have a tractor metric, so, and now we've formed a tractor so we can contract it to itself using the tractor metric. I'll denote that I squared for brief, right? So using the formula for the tractor metric, it's just that, right? So um, <coughs> remember the, the way we give the tractor metric it sort of has the, has the metric in the middle and, and these off diagonal ones. So, so when you contract this sigma with itself, the sigma gets paired with that term, that's that there, and you get two copies of that and then the middle, the middle part. Okay, so... We have some immediate sort of consequences of this. So what is this thing measuring, this, this length of the scale tractor? Well, it's actually just a scalar curvature, really, or, or up to a sign and a number, right? So, so this, where, where sigma's not zero, <coughs> um, then if you compute in the scale of sigma, then the, the levy severed connection kills sigma, and, and most of these terms go away, and you're just left with this J bit, right? So, so basically, in the scale of sigma, I squared is just some number times the trace of the Scouten tensor. So it's giving you minus the scalar curvature over dd minus 1. <clears throat> but of course, this thing is, is polynomial in the jets of sigma, so it's actually just defined everywhere. Okay, so you, you may have some manifold. This is my usual picture. And perhaps sigma's um, you know, not equal to, say, greater than zero here, and sigma might be less than zero here, and then sigma equals zero. This can happen, but um, this, this thing, this I squared is giving you more or less the scalar curvature here and also here, but it, as a function, it extends smoothly across there. So it's a, sort of a generalization of the scalar curvature that extends across the zero locus. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the punchline at the bottom there. Okay, right, so that's some sort of background. So let's go back and try and start understanding those compactifications. So we want to we wanna sort of use both our simple understanding of, of the models and, and what we've just learned about these tractors in a sense. Okay, now remember... <coughs> um, <clears throat> Yesterday I, I explained, you know, that, that the conformal sphere is, is born by taking this ray projectivization of, of this null cone. We equip Rd plus 2 with this Lorentzian metric. We have a null cone. We just look at the forward part, say. We take the ray projectivization of that, and that gave us a sphere. And we argued that that had a conformal structure because each section of this projectivization actually determines a metric. On there, and the different choices give us conformally related metrics. Okay, right, so we have that. And the other thing we learned was that, <coughs> the, that, that the tractor bundle comes from just the affine parallel transport on Rd plus 2, sort of restricted to that cone with a little bit of identification. 
Okay, so, so now, <clears throat> suppose I break the symmetry here. So here, you know, I would have um, S, S, SO uh, D plus 2 comma 1 acting on this. Um, <clears throat> but suppose now, um, oh, was it SO D plus 1 1? Sorry, yeah, that's what I mean. SO D plus 1 1 acts on this, and it acts principally <coughs> on the sphere. <clears throat> okay, so... Now I want to break that symmetry by introducing a, a space-like vector, right? Just a constant vector i, or one form, or whatever. So, you know, perhaps i is just um, 0, <laughs> 0, comma 1, right? So that would be a space-like um, such vector. So and I've drawn a, a cartoon of it there, right? So here it is. So then I can form this homogeneous polynomial by just contracting that into the ambient coordinates. <laughs> or contracting it, if you like, with the Euler vector field, right? So the XA. So I get this sigma tilde, which is homogeneous of degree 1. Right? Good. Now, picking this kind of broke the symmetry. So, so now, <clears throat> you know, if I want to fix that I, um, that space light, so that would reduce the group down to SOD, 1. And then the sphere would, would break into orbits, right? So that for that smaller group. And in fact, you know, you would end up, it would, you know, you'll see here that it ends up with these two open orbits and a closed orbit. But let's understand it in a more basic sense. So, so, um, so what I claim is that, that well, okay, so, so, this, so this sigma tilde homogeneous function, I can set it equal to 1. Why not? There it is, sigma tilde equals 1. What is that? Well, it's determining some sort of hyperplane. That hyperplane intersects the... <clears throat> the null cone, right? That's the dotted line. Now, it's not a section of, of the whole, um, over the whole sphere, but over part of the sphere, that's a section. So it must be determining a metric. That's what we're talking about. What is the metric it induces? Right. The hyperbolic metric. Right? <laughs> it's, it's the hyperbolic section, basically. So, so but if, you know, if you just calculate it directly, you'd find out that that gave you the hyperbolic metric. What about, what about if I put sigma tilde equals to zero? Then the hyperplane goes through the origin. What's the, what's the geometry I get induced here? It must be conformal, right? Because, it's just, because that's just a cone of one lower dimension, and I'm doing the ray projectivization of it. So, that, so this, this equator gets a conformal structure on it. So we've got a hyperbolic metric on this half. We've got a conformal structure on the boundary. Now let's go and look at our, our tractor picture. So according to what I was saying, this I must be also be able to think of it as a parallel tractor, right? So um, it's a parallel tractor and it's space-like. Remember we said that, and it's got constant length. <laughs> so that means the scalar curvature is going to be constant. That sign is plus. Remember there was a minus sign in the relation, so it's going to have negative um, scalar curvature. So we've got a conformally flat structure with a negative <laughs> scalar curvature metric. So that's why you know it's the hyperbolic metric. And also from the tractor <coughs> picture, we know that the way that the <coughs> we know that the way that the metric comes about from the from the sort of conformal metric is by the sigma to the minus two, right? So this sigma to the minus two is coming from the sigma tilde here, or sigmas represented by sigma tilde. So densities of weight 1 get represented by functions homogeneous of degree 1. <coughs> and so, um, <coughs> so you can actually see that this is a conformal compactification of hyperbolic space. It follows from this picture that the derivative of sigma is nowhere vanishing along that zero locus. So that's the end of the story. So this is the conformal compactification of hyperbolic space. Okay, so we've basically recovered that Poincaré ball model that we had to fish, right? Except you go, hang on, you know, this is on a sphere, that was in a plane. So how do we finish it? Everyone's more coffee? <laughs> so, so now, if you really want to finish it and make it look exactly like that, you know, you, you put another plane here, or thing, and you do stereographic projection from that point, and then it's, again, of course, it's conformal. Yep. And the, and the fish appear, right, just like magic. They drop out of the sky. Okay, oh, so yeah, before I go on, there's an exercise, but let's just do it here. <laughs> so, what about the Euclidean compactification? That was a one point compactification. What do I do? Oh, 
God. So, <laughs> so right. So, t- so what about taking a null vector, right? This is space-like. If I take a null vector, then the section <coughs> will just miss one generator of this. It's easy to see. Like, you know, the section where you put sigma to the x to 1 and i is null, it just slopes up here and it misses exactly the i that's parallel to it. So that's the one-point compactification. <coughs> because i is 0 when it's squared, that means the scalar curvature is 0. So you have a conformally flat <laughs> scalar curvature flat thing. And it <coughs> it's picking up the whole sphere except for one point. That's your Euclidean compactification. So you see now that <coughs> these features, like the one-point compactification, the fact that the, the fish had a, had a hypersurface boundary, this is just coming out of the picture, it's sort of trivially. May well, I have a question? Yep. Um, so are these things really boundary in general, or can that picture over there occur as well? That I have like a boundary in the middle of... Uh, yep, that can occur. So, okay. it, d- it did occur, right? You just saw well, it. Well, I mean, this might... Yeah. <laughs> you, you just saw it. If we do the other side of this, <laughs> then, then um, where sigma tilde is minus one, it's giving us hyperbolic space yeah. on the other side, yeah. and that's the boundary in the middle. But, okay, but then it's not actual boundary, right? It's, it's well, it's, it's, a, it's a conformal infinity that's yeah. dividing yeah, the yeah, manifold yeah, okay. of two. Yeah. Okay, so what about <laughs> um, in, in, in other signatures? So um, we, we were also interested in this... Um, uh, What's it called? The Einstein cylinder, you know. So, so we would like to see that come out, wouldn't we? So, so here, <coughs> if we take the Lorentzian model, remember we said that we got this conformal model, which was S1 cross Sn. That was the flat conformal geometry, the group SOD comma two x transitively, blah blah blah. Um, so, <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah. So, so again, we we think the same way. So we we pick, we pick a vector. Um, <coughs> that's constant, it corresponds to a parallel tractor, and then there are these cases that its, that it's squared length could be minus 1, it could be 0, it could be plus 1, or other constants, but you know, that won't make much difference, right? So what happens is, <coughs> well, suppose you want to get the Einstein cylinder, so you want to get Minkowski space, right? So, <coughs> so, so I squared equals 0 means the scalar curvature is going to be 0, <coughs> and indeed you see that if you take I squared equals 0, um, that the zero locus divides that, that sort of torusy thing, S1 cross Sm, <coughs> into two parts, which is, which is mainly separated by a hypersurface, but there are some singular points. And the singular points are where the canonical tractor, the sort of Euler vector field in the model, is parallel to the null tractor that you picked. So it gives you two points on this torus thing that are, that are the funny points, and that's the I plus and the I zero. <clears throat> okay, so, so, that, so the, and the Einstein cylinder, you know, what you've got when you do this is, is just if you take that Einstein cylinder and you glue the opposite ends, that's exactly what we've, we've picked up here. So you see where that picture comes from now. And if you take I squared to be minus one, um, <coughs> then, um, then, then what that does is, it, 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 if you like, it splits this S1 into two intervals, <coughs> and then you get, um, you get compactified to sitter because because I squared equals minus one means the scalar curve which is constant and positive, and you know this this divides this into into you know with a hypersurface into these two parts with the conformal infinity separating them. Like, again, answering your question, right? So and then finally, if you take I squared equal to one, then you're going to have negative scalar curvature, and now it's it, it, the S one doesn't get split, but the hemisphere part gets split by the by the zero locus, and that gives you your two copies of anti de Sitter. Um, and now, you know, for instance, the, the I squared equal to plus one means that where sigma zero, then the D sigma squared is going to be space-like, so, so in, in its annihilator is something of Lorentzian signature, which is what you expect on the boundary of, of uh, anti de Sitter. So all, you know, all of those models just come out. <laughs> okay, so um, now, now a sort of word from our sponsor. Um, so, so I want to say that this, this pic fits into a bigger picture. So, and I, w- I won't go talk about this much, but this, this is kind of you know, a big picture behind this. And this is this, uh, what we call curved orbit decomposition with, with Andy Chapp and Matthias Hammerl. Um, so in general, if you have a Cartan geometry, and you know, people are talking about what that means here, so I won't, 
won't go in more than what I've said. But, um, but if it's equipped with a parallel tractor field, um, that gives a, so that will give you some sort of holonomy reduction at the Cartan level. Okay, and I'll say with holonomy group H. But <clears throat> the, the group H is just what stabilizes that parallel tractor. You know? So as we saw with, with when we, the examples we've looked at, we were looking at SOD plus 1, 1 or something like that, and we had a, a parallel standard tractor. So that was, that was reducing you down to you know, SOD1 or whatever. You know? So that sort of thing. But you, you know, this could be a, um, like a, a complex structure on the tractor bundle or, or something else, you know? so giving you a holonomy reduction. <clears throat> then what this theorem tells you is that if you look at the model and you had um, such a parallel object on the model, well that would, that would reduce you, you know, your group down and then you would have the smaller group H that would act on G mod P. So H is, is your holonomy group sitting in G mod P and your thing would decompose into orbits. So this curved orbit theorem says that if you have a Cartan geometry with the same sort of parallel tractor that gave you that reduction of the model, then, they, then the curved version of the geometry that's supporting this uh, Cartan connection um, will, will decompose in a way locally that looks like what happens in the model. So in other words, if this is a smooth separating hypersurface in the model, in this curved setting, this will be a smooth separating hypersurface. If you can have these funny, funny isolated points like we had in the example of the Einstein cylinder that we just derived, then, then that can happen in the curved case as well. So, so, <clears throat> so, that, so this gives a sort of powerful way to um, start to make curved versions of these interesting structures that turn up for, with orbit uh, decompositions. <clears throat> and, and on the different orbits, you then get Cartan geometries as the same type as on the model and so on. So we'll go back to just looking at that specifically, but I just want you to have in mind that there's that very general picture that we could be dealing with you know, unitary groups or something else instead of, instead of this elementary setting. Okay, so what about almost Einstein just applying that curved orbit theorem that I just mentioned? So an almost Einstein manifold means you've got a conformal manifold equipped with a parallel standard tractor. <clears throat> okay, so then the answer is it has to look, according to that curved orbit theorem, like the model. And we knew what the model looked like, right? So the, um, <clears throat> we've talked about the different versions. So, so either, um, so if I, we're in, in any signature here, but if, if this parallel tractor has non-zero length, so it'll be Einstein and not Ricci flat, then the zero locus um, is either empty um, or it's a smooth, uh, smoothly embedded separating hypersurface. Let me see, hang on. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, so that's correct. So if I squared is not zero, <laughs> then, then the zero locus is always a smooth embedded separating hypersurface. If there is a zero locus, you know, your manifold may not have one. <laughs> if, if it's null, then um, after excluding some isolated points, it's a smooth separating hypersurface. So it's, you know, just like our models, basically. Um, and then what happens is, so I guess I have the picture here, and I'm going to put it up on the next slide, but um, if you take one of these pieces, like this is M plus, where sigma is positive and this is M minus, then if, if you leave this M minus bit out, then this is a compactification of the M plus. It's a conformal compactification. So that's what this bit is saying. <coughs> so, so M plus union, the zero locus, is a conformal compactification of the M plus bit, and so on. So these are, because it's parallel, these are actually Poincaré-Einstein. Right? So if you, <coughs> if you started with a closed manifold and you got this picture to turn up, then you get Poincaré-Einsteins glued along the conformal infinities. <coughs> okay, so what is the proof of this? Well, it's really just that that's what happened in the model, so it's going to happen in the curved case. There's some little details. You have to know that the metric comes from like that and, and that this derivative is nowhere uh, <coughs> vanishing on the parts where it's zero. And that, but that, we'll sort of come to that. Okay, so here's the picture, but that's the picture I've just got here. So <coughs> if, if it's parallel and, and the scalar curvature is, not, is nowhere zero, you know, so then <coughs> um, we have a picture like this. So that's what can happen if you start with a closed manifold. <coughs> um, and yeah, this is all about what I was just saying. Okay, now, um, 
we just we already talked in a sense about this non uh, so the fact that i squared gives you a uh, um, generalization of the scalar curvature right? so so i squared is is up to a sign and a number the the scalar curvature but it generalizes it because it's well defined where sigma is zero right so um, so in fact the point i want to make in this you know this part of the lecture is that <clears throat> That actually a lot of a lot of this picture survives without I being parallel, right? So, um, so you might think, oh, this is that picture is coming from the parallelness, but it's actually coming from much less, right? So, um, so what I'm saying here is that a lot of that survives if we just require the scale scale tractor squared to be nowhere vanishing or non-vanishing, right? So this is the what I called um, almost pseudo-Romanian. Okay, so so let you have a conformal manifold equipped with with a scale tractor such that its squared length is nowhere zero, right? So that's what I mean by almost pseudo Romanian. <coughs> then um, then the zero locus, if it's not empty, it could be empty, of course. So is a smooth embedded separating hypersurface, and it's space-like or time-like, um, <coughs> you know, just depending on on the sign of this. All right, and then the, the, the how do you prove that? Well, it, it's actually blindingly simple, right? So I squared is given by this simple sort of polynomial in the Jets type formula that I mentioned, right? So, so where sigma is zero, this Laplacian term and the scalar curvature term drop out. So remember on the interior, we said the opposite. Oh, when you work in the scale of sigma, these derivatives drop out, and this thing just <coughs> only remains as the scalar curvature. But when you go to the bit where sigma is zero, then you can't do that, of course. But but what this um, squared length is giving you is is giving you the length of this co-normal along the zero set, this this um, derivative of sigma. <coughs> okay. So so but if i squared is nowhere vanishing, then that means that the derivative of sigma is nowhere zero, where sigma is zero. <laughs> so by by the constant rank theorem, you you get a you know a smoothly embedded separating hypersurface. And that's all that's going on really. So. Um, so, so now it's the same picture, but with weaker assumptions, right? So, so if um, the scale tractor is has a squared length not equal to zero, um, so it's nowhere zero on your manifold, then then it decomposes in this way. Right? So um, that's that's all it's saying here. So we've got the conformal manifold equipped with the scale tractor um, as such that i squared is nowhere zero then you'll have a smooth separating hypersurface um, whenever you have a zero locus of sigma. <clears throat> okay, and then, now the point is that I gave you a sort of traditional definition of conformally compact at the start. Um, in fact, all, this is another way of understanding conformally compact. If I throw away this M minus bit, this is a conformal compactification of the M plus bit. And it's, an, it's a sort of a different way of defining it, right? So we can take conformal compactification to mean it's a manifold with boundary, it's equipped with one of these scale tractors with I squared being nowhere zero, um, and the zero locus of sigma being exactly the boundary. And that's it, right? That's, that's what conformally compact means. Now, <coughs> at first, you, you know, you might say, oh, well, you know, Rod likes tractors, so that's just, <laughs> you know, he wants to define conformally compact like that, right? So good on him, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, see you later, Rod. Um, but, but actually, this, this is a good idea, right? So we'll, we'll see in the next lecture that, that you, you get um, output from that. <coughs> okay, so looks like I'm even going to finish on time today. I must have gone very fast. They say, Jan yelled at me so much yesterday. So. <laughs> I was shaking all night. Oh, I, said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had nightmares. I woke up in the night. Jan was coming at me with a big night. So... <laughs> Um, the aim of the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had different nightmares tonight. <laughs> so um, yeah, okay. So so what what we're going to do when we look ahead is is <clears throat> so instead a sort of different way of thinking of geometry is we can replace thinking of like just a Romanian manifold as thinking of a conformal manifold equipped with one of these scale tractors, and then that includes usual Romanian geometry, of course, or pseudo Romanian geometry. Why not? But you mainly gain you gain um, something from this when when there's a zero locus for the top slot of the scale tractor. So remember, always 
the I is, you know, what I mean by I is one of these scale chapters. So I have equals sigma, and grad sigma, and minus the plus C and sigma plus J sigma. Okay, so it's, <coughs> so you, you think of it as equipped with that, and of course, it, 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 it wouldn't be very useful to do Romanian geometry thinking of it this way unless you, unless you have some parts where sigma is zero. And then, of course, once you do, then this, this is sort of telling you how that geometry, it's going to help us learn how that geometry on the zero locus is linked to the geometry on the bulk. Right? <coughs> um, so we just saw that it, you can think of a conformal compactification as a manifold with boundary. The, zero, the boundary is going to be the zero locus of sigma. Um, and you ask that I squared's non-vanishing. This is to get the usual um, notion of conformal compactification, like, like people use in Romanian signature and analysis and so on. You know, th this is not now the case of the Einstein cylinder because I squared is, is, is zero then. You can use this to study those things, of course, but, but that, it's a slightly more complicated story. Um, now, the point I want to make and come to in the next lecture is that, you know, in, in Romanian geometry, um, the metric produces you know, geometric operators. So, um, <coughs> like the Parsian is formed by um, the metric determines levi civita connections, and then you contract them together with the metric again, and you've made, uh, you've made a geometric operator. And I guess in physics, this is linked to this minimal coupling idea, right? Yeah, so, so <coughs> um, you're, you're using that to, to form operators. But now, if we think of geometry this way, then, then um, we're replacing G with, with the conformal structure plus the scale tractor, then there'll be other things you can do other than this, right? Namely, you can, you can try and contract the scale tractor into things and so on, and make things that don't strictly fall into that category, but they're sort of natural in the same way. Um, and that, that will turn out to be um, <coughs> a good idea. Okay, so it looks like that's where I was planning to finish. So, uh, so in the case of the of the metric being uh, the G naught being on the inside and the ball G being on the whole on the whole M bar, right? You said that uh, if we rescale R, the defining function for the metric, that it can be absorbed on the on the boundary metric. Yeah. But you haven't mentioned any kind of formula or relationship between the. So is it simple? Or is it no, no, that, that's a simple thing, right? So, so the point is, uh, where's my dust? Um, so, <clears throat> the point is that you, you know, you have this um, g bar. Uh, I guess it was r squared times g plus, right? This is fixed, so if you if you change this to um, like SR, so R gets mapped to SR, right? Then um, G plus is going to get mapped to S squared um, G bar. Yeah, but then <laughs> to get the boundary thing, you're just restricting <coughs> restricting this to the boundary. Well, really to the <laughs> tangent bundle to the boundary. And you restrict this to the tangent bundle to the boundary. Ah. And it's just conformally related. That's all that's going on there. Yeah. Yep. There was a asterisk after saying that you can get all conformally compact or all conformal compactifications using the scale tractor method. Was that to suggest that there are some exceptions or was that just Well I think it was I think I mean um, I can't remember what I put the asterisk, but, it, but it's probably just talking about this. You know, this is the case. Um, this is not included in the case where the scale curvature is zero. Okay, so, so because you know Einstein, oh sorry, Einstein, Penrose, had, uh, he he was one of the first you know 
pioneers of using this notion of conformal compactification. So although I, I, I um, motivated the conformal compactification here more from the, this hyperbolic case, Penrose was no doubt thinking of the Einstein cylinder type thing. Okay. So again, uh, you know, on the, you still have the same thing along the zero locus. The zero locus is a function, um, you know, and, and the metric is the inverse of that. It's the boundary is the zero locus of function, and the metric that goes to the boundary sort of is, is um, related by that function squared and so on. But now the boundary is null, you know, so. Okay. Yeah. But, so it just gets more complicated. But, okay. Yeah. Any other questions? If it is. Oh, I will then have a few announcements. Oh, so let's, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>